So welcome ladies to our first week of No Fair, where we're gonna be studying the book of Job, and I'm gonna kick us off today. So we live obviously in a crazy world, in some crazy times, and guess what? We're not the first ones. We're not the first ones in history to have this. There have always been weird things going on, and when bad things happen that we don't understand, I think our minds try to find a logical explanation or a reason for it. It's natural. I mean, have you ever been told that someone was diagnosed with, say, lung cancer? What's the first question that often comes to your mind, whether you ask it aloud or not? I have to confess, for me, in my mind, I'm thinking, ooh, I wonder if they were a smoker. Or if you hear that someone suffered a heart attack, hey, were, were they taking care of themselves? Were they, were they eating healthy? Or if someone loses their home or they go through bankruptcy, our, our questions in our mind, hopefully not always out loud, are, hey, were they irresponsible? Did they get themselves into debt? And I think the reason why, at least for me, is I feel like if we can answer that question and if there's a logical explanation, then we can avoid that. Hey, I don't smoke, so I'm not gonna get cancer. Hey, I eat healthy and I exercise, so I'm not gonna have heart condition and I uh, take care of my money and I am a good steward of it, so I'm not gonna have any financial issues. But the truth of the matter is, we also know people who have gone through these things and worse through no fault of their own. They did everything right and they still went through tough times. So that brings us to this book that we're gonna be talking about over the next four weeks. Job is a very unique book in the Bible. It's a book that I think many of us struggle with and we probably even want to avoid a lot of times. And it's funny because I think it's a book that even non-believers are familiar with. You've probably heard the phrase, oh, they have the patience of Job. And so even people who are not familiar with it are somewhat familiar with the, the general story. We're not sure who wrote it, uh, in fact, it may have been written by more than one person. We're not even sure exactly when it was written. A lot of these books in the Old Testament will reference certain historical events where they can kind of trace back when it happened. And this one, they don't really talk about that. It's really all about Job. And it's considered one of the wisdom books along with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And however we might feel about it going into these next four weeks, there's much to be learned about it. We can learn our, about our relationship with God and about how he feels about us. So in, this, in these next four weeks, we're gonna explore this amazing book. And I hope along the way that you discover some new things about yourself and maybe how you react to bad circumstances. And more importantly, I hope you discover things about God and his mercy and his grace toward us, even in the midst of those tough circumstances. So today we're going to just start with the first two chapters. And I think as you're going to see when we're done, there's a lot that goes on in these two chapters. And let's start and see how the story begins. So we are, uh, as a church, some of you may be participating in the detox and, and you may have given up certain things. Uh, one thing that I didn't give up that I probably should have is my TV binge watching. I have tried to cut back on it. I just, I love I just love good TV. And so putting it into that context, the book of Job really has a couple different scenes going on. If you ever watch any different kinds of shows where there are different characters, they start out in one scene and you have one group of people and then they'll shift to another scene and there's a whole other storyline going on. Job is a little bit like that in that there are two stories really woven into one. There's a story going on here down on earth and there's another story going on in heaven. So our first scene, opens up. We're here on earth and we're introduced to this man, Job, who was from a land called Uz, U-Z. And we're not really sure where this was. It may have been referring to a region rather than to a specific city or place. I, I kind of think it might be a little like here in Southern California, we have certain areas that people refer to and they're not really specifically designated that way on a map, for example, the Inland Empire. So years and years from now, if somebody today referenced the Inland Empire and somebody years from now reads about it, they may think, I'm not really sure what they were talking about when they said that. So it might be a little bit like that. So it starts off saying that Job is described as a man who was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Now, this doesn't mean that Job was sinless 
or perfect. Every human being has sinned and Job is no different. It just means that he did seek after God and he consistently tried to do the right thing and maintain a right relationship with God. And as we're going to see when we switch to our other scene in a few moments, he does apparently stand out to God as such a man because in verse eight, God does say to Satan, there's no one on earth like him. So that's, can you imagine being a person that God points out and says, there's no one on earth like her. I, that would be amazing. I don't, I don't think that God would probably say that of me, but that would be amazing. So following the description of his character, it's interesting. It goes on to almost an inventory of everything he has. And it starts off, I would say, maybe with the most important, which is his family. It talks about the fact that he has three daughters and seven sons and a lot of animals, including 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. And if I understand that correctly, that would mean pears and 500 donkeys. I have one dog. And in my mind right now, I'm just thinking of the cleanup for the one dog compared to, yeah, okay, I digress. That's a whole other thing. So he also had a lot of servants because he had people taking care of all of these animals as well. So you may, that may seem odd, like why are they listing everything? But it's important to understand in the Hebrew culture, wealth and possessions were a sign of God's blessing. In fact, back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses two through six, it says, all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. So if you think about it in that context, especially I want you to keep that in mind for future weeks when you start hearing about other people and other scenes coming into the picture, their context was to think of it as, hey, Job's got all this stuff, so God must be blessing him. And that's going to play a part later when we start learning about other characters. So He's a wealthy, successful man with a lot of children, and his children apparently had good relationships with each other. In fact, it says that on a regular basis, his sons would host meals and they would invite their sisters over. And Job, being the godly man that he was, he also acted as the priest for the family. And what that meant is that he purified them in Jewish tradition. Remember, they didn't have Christ at this time, so they had to atone and always be watching for sinfulness all along the way. And so he purified them just in case they had sinned. And this was his lifelong habit. It was his regular custom. And so it seems that if anyone deserves to have good things, it was this guy, it was Job. So that's our first scene. Now, scene two, we're looking back up into heaven. And the story going on here is a conversation between God and Satan. And I think this is also a good reminder to us that there is so much more going on than we can see. I get so tunnel vision. I look at what's going on down here on earth and the day-to-day -day things. And uh, sometimes it's easy to forget that there's a whole spiritual world and there are whole things, a whole lot of things going on in heaven that we can't even wrap our brains around. So in verse six, it says that in heaven, the angels approached God and Satan was with them. And it's kind of funny, you know, you think they're enemies. It sounds just like a kind of an everyday conversation with your neighbor. So God basically asked Satan, so where you been? What you been doing? What you been up to? And Satan says, yeah, you know, no biggie, just wandering the earth, checking things out. And so God says, oh, really? Uh, did you happen to notice my guy Satan? Or I'm sorry. Did you happen to notice my guy Job? Because he's blameless. He's upright. He fears me and he turns away from evil. Yeah. Satan replies in verses nine through 11. <laughs> yeah. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You bless the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has. Take all that stuff away. Then let's see how much. He praises you. I think at that point, he will curse you to your face. Now, this leads to a question, which is also our first application point. Do we trust God only when everything is good in our lives? Now, 
I have grown up in the church. I accepted Christ at, at a young age. I would love to stand here and tell you that if my world were completely rocked, uh, that my faith would still remain strong. I hope so. I have been fortunate so far to not have experienced any extreme loss. So it's, it's hard to say. Not that I haven't had bad days or gone through tough things. I'm fortunate, though, in that I still have my, my family, my parents, and I haven't suffered any great loss. But I think few things test our faith more than the loss of someone that we love or something uh, that we hold dear. And I think being successful, having everything that we want, can have one of two possible consequences. Either we'll become proud and think, oh yeah, I got all this stuff on my own, and we can start to forget that God was the one who provided that. Or, in, like in Job's case, we could decide that, hey, we're going to honor God more because he's blessed us and trusted us with all of these things. And that was definitely Job. So I doubt that Job took his family or his possessions for granted. I also think he probably didn't foresee what was coming. So back to our scene with Satan and God. So after Satan brought up that point of, yeah, take everything away and then I'll bet he'll, he'll curse you to your face. God said, fine, you know what? Have at him. I'm going to leave him to you. Everything he has is in your hands. It's fair game, but you are not allowed to lay a hand on Job himself. So this is interesting. What does this tell us about God's power versus Satan's power? Not to underestimate Satan's power because he is powerful and we would be, uh, I think it's, a, it's, we need to be cautious about thinking that he's totally weak and underestimate him. At the same time, it's interesting to me that as prideful and as powerful as Satan seems to be, God still set the parameters. God told him, you cannot do more than this. And Satan was not allowed to do more than that. So that probably then leads to a question of, well, then why would God let him? Why would he let him do anything? I have no easy answer to that question for you. And after these four weeks, we may still not. I think, though, we're going to kind of delve into that a little bit more over the next four weeks. So I think it also might be to kind of mess with Satan a little bit, to kind of let him think he has some control over this, give him the illusion that he has more power than he really does. Maybe it's also to strengthen our faith and our trust in God and also to stretch the faith and trust of those around us. Because when you go through something tough, if you are around non-believers, they're watching to see how you handle that. And sometimes the greatest testimony to God's power and grace is a non-believer seeing how you hold up in the midst of a tough circumstance. So Satan, given this limited power, has a plan in mind, and he went off on his merry little way to take care of it. And in one day, here's what happened to Job. So, and, and the way that it, it's written it almost sounds like these things happened almost simultaneously, and Job seemed to find out about them simultaneously. So here's, here's what happens. Uh, a group of servants come to tell him, hey, uh, a group from another place came to where his oxen and his donkeys were and carried them off and killed the servants who were there with him. So he lost half of his livestock. Then a fire came down from heaven and burned up his sheep and his servants. Oh, and then another raiding party came and stole all his camels. How do, how do you steal 3,000 camels? I don't even know. That's, so now he's lost all his wealth and possessions. Now the worst. While his sons and daughters were eating at one of the son's houses, it says a huge wind came through. It was so strong that it blew the house down, collapsed on all of his children, and killed them all, all seven of his kids in one day. And... He was getting this news back to back. He's standing there. One servant tells him, hey, your, your oxen and your donkeys, gone. Hey, your sheep are gone. Hey, your camels are gone. And now to find out about his kids. I, I can't even wrap my brain around that kind of loss. And how do you deal with all of that news all at one time? And so how does Job respond? Well, in chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And he got down on his knees, and he shaved his head in a show of grief, and he worshiped God. How, how do you worship God after going through that? It's, it's incredible to me. And in verse 22, it tells us, 
He did not sin in all of this. You would think this would be enough to convince Satan of Job's righteousness and fear of God. But as we'll see, that's not the case. So now we move into chapter two. We're back in heaven now. Satan comes back to God. And again, there's this kind of seemingly casual conversations. God says, so Satan, where you been? What you been doing? And Satan again tells him that, yeah, I've been, you know, wandering the earth, checking things out. And God says, hey, did you notice my guy Job? Even after you took everything away, he is still blameless and upright, and he's still honoring me. Take that. And here's what that tells us about God. And this is our second application point. When we're going through the tough times, God has not forgotten us. Through all of this loss, through all of this news of everything being taken from him, there's no indication that God was in contact, that Job heard anything from God about any of this or got any comfort from him. And that doesn't mean that God was unaware and didn't care. He was fully aware of everything that was going on. So earlier I mentioned that I, I haven't gone through anything that, I mean, certainly nothing anywhere close to what Job has gone through. Uh, there have been times when I've experienced other types of loss or, or circumstances that, that brought me down or, or made me anxious. And there have been times when I have felt just a heaviness for no apparent reason. I mean, have you ever had days where you wake up and you just feel like, bleh, and yet you can't put your finger on, on exactly what it is? And in those times, I often feel like God is, is silent. Sometimes that's when he seems far away, and I'll find myself searching through Scripture, trying to find anything that would give me some kind of comfort or, or proof that God's going to get me through it. He's always faithful, and he always does bring me through it. Even when I couldn't sense his presence in that moment, I always came out on the other side. And you might wonder, why do we even have to go through that? And I think sometimes it's because faith grows most in the midst of struggle. I, I think our faith is made stronger. It's kind of like no pain, no gain. If we don't go through that struggle, our faith never has the opportunity to get strong. And God is still there even when we don't feel like it. And some of you may be experiencing something like that right now. Maybe you have had extreme loss. In this last year, I know a lot of people have. Maybe you're struggling with depression or pain or anxiety or the loss of, of friends or loved ones. But know that whatever the reason that in those times when you can't sense his presence, God is aware he knows what's going on, and he has not forgotten you. So back to the conversation between God and Satan. Again, you'd think that would have just shut it down, but <laughs> Satan comes back to God and says, well, uh, sure, he still worships you. You know, a man will give up everything as long as he's still alive. You didn't touch him. But if you mess with him directly and physically, then he would certainly curse you to your face. It's kind of like, yeah, losing his family and stuff, that wasn't really that big of a deal. But if you mess with him, then that's going to that's gonna be what does it. And God gives him the go-ahead. Okay, again, still within certain parameters. He says, go ahead, take your best shot, but you cannot kill him. So again, there's a limit to the power that Satan's going to have. So Satan goes out and he gives Job painful sores all over his body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. I, I can't imagine. I don't know exactly what this might have been like. It says it was so painful, Job took a piece of broken pot and was using it to scrape the wounds, maybe just to try to get some kind of relief. I don't know how that would be a relief, but it just sounds awful. Can you imagine? I, I have not gone through any type of physical pain like that either. I've never even so much as broken a bone. I'm just a big pansy, apparently. I'm, I'm one of those who, when I get like a stomach flu or sick and I'm sitting there on the couch, I'm <laughs> I can't reach the remote. It's like six inches away. I'm like that kind of a baby. So I, I can't, I would not do as well as, as Job did. So now let's add his wife to the mix. We haven't heard anything about her yet. So he does have a wife and she was not one of the party that was lost in, in all of this. And she comes to him and he, she says, you're still holding on to your integrity. Curse God and die. Now, I used to read that and think, wow, great wife. And I, I think a lot of us sit in judgment of her thinking, how could she act like that? 
And the more I, I kind of thought about it differently this time, thinking, you know what? It's easy to forget that she suffered all of the same losses that he did. She lost all seven of her children in one day. What kind of pain could that be? And maybe it wasn't, you know, we read it like, curse God and die. You know what? Maybe it was, you know what, honey? Let go. Just, just let go and, and leave if you need to, because that would be the easier way out. So here is probably, hers is probably the more natural reaction and probably what Job or what Satan was expecting Job to do. So Job responds to her, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? So in, in other words, like our first application point earlier, do we only praise God when things are good? And I think Job's statement about coming into the world with nothing and leaving with nothing brings us to our third application point, which is we should view our earthly circumstances in light of an eternal perspective. And this is so much easier said than done. I think it also goes back to being aware that there's this whole heavenly realm. I am very attached to my life here on earth. It's what I know. I have hopes and dreams. I hope to grow old here. I hope to retire. I hope to go on trips and travel. And so I, I see it in a very short kind of tunnel vision sometimes. And I forget that there is so much more beyond this in eternity. And it brought to mind um, several years ago, some of you may, may have been, been here at that point. It's uh, before our West Auditorium was built. And Doyle, uh, one of his sermons, it was in the East Auditorium. And he was talking about how we need to be thinking more in terms of eternity and not be so short-sighted. And he had a, a, like a string. I mean, it was is not like a, maybe something between a string and a rope. And up on the stage, um, he was holding one end and they had a staff uh, person at church take the other end. It was, a, it was a really long string. They went down the main aisle of the East Auditorium, out the doors, through the lobby, out the main doors. At that time, the West Auditorium wasn't there. So across the long courtyard into the parking lot, it was far. And they had a camera person follow them out so that up on the screen in the auditorium, we could see how far they were going. It was like, wow, they're way out there. And he, as Doyle held up that string, he kind of pointed out, I mean, maybe an inch. And he said, this is our life on earth compared to eternity. This may be what, 80 years we get if we're lucky? It's that much. And really, to even say that is limiting it because that string would go on forever. And it was a picture of, wow, I am worried about this one inch when really God has so much more beyond this that is so much better that we can't even begin to imagine. And how might that change your perspective? It changed Job's. It seems like he had that idea that, you know what? There's more to this life than these things. So I think this should change our perspective. And as we get to the last few verses in chapter two, we're introduced to three of Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Now, they had heard about all that had happened to Job. And so they got together and they chose to come to him and sympathize and comfort him. And it says that when they saw him from a distance, they started weeping because they didn't even recognize him. I would imagine between the grief of all of that loss and then these sores that affected him physically, he, can you imagine? Unrecognizable. We don't know how much time went by between all of that happening to Job and these friends coming. It may not have been that long. So in a show of their grief, they tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads and sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. So that tearing of the robe, putting dust on your head, that was a Jewish tradition of mourning when they lost someone. And it says that for seven days and nights, they sat with him and no one said a word because they saw how much Job was suffering. How incredible is that? Can you imagine just sitting with a grieving friend for seven days and nights and not saying one word, just crying with them? Have you ever had a friend who went through something horrible? And in, in those times, I'm sometimes a little uncomfortable about, gosh, what do I say? I don't, I don't know what to say to help them. And I'm always afraid of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. And I think these verses show that sometimes we don't need to say anything or do anything. Sometimes we just need to sit with our friends and silently cry with them. And so that brings us to our final and our, our fourth point, which is if a friend is grieving, don't be afraid to be there and don't be afraid of silence. 
Maybe God's going to speak through you or to you in that moment. Maybe it's going to speak to your friend. So this, in these two chapters, this is just the start of Job's story and already so much has happened. So I hope you'll stay with us for the next three weeks because you're going to learn about some other things that are happening. And so as we are ending this time together, you might think, I was hoping to get an answer to all these tough questions and and figure out why do bad things happen? Yeah, cliffhanger. You're going to have to wait and kind of work through it over the next three weeks. And some of that will also come, hopefully you're part of a small group, talking with other women about it in your discussion groups is also going to be a way to sift through because you're going to learn things, hopefully from these teaching times, you will likely learn just as much, if not more from each other in those discussions that you have together. So I hope you enjoy your groups and hope to see you back. Have a great week, everybody.